Analytics, uh, as well as co-owner. Um, I'll give you a little bit of history about myself and sort of how it relates to the discussion we're going to have today. So, uh, my brother and I actually bought this company uh, November of 2008. We've been around since about 1972. But what we found very early on was that people were just not familiar with what we actually do and what the capabilities were. Um, so hopefully this will be uh, uh, educational for you. We won't get into any real specific detail, give you just a general overview of the value proposition that we sort of uh, uh, create and uh, present. Uh, if anybody has any further questions, we'll have a Q&A at the very end as well as, of course, you can stop by our booth and see some more examples of it. Uh, so what is pressure forming? So um, generally what I get at these shows is people uh, don't know what pressure forming is. They've heard of thermoforming or vacuum forming and wonder what the difference is with, with pressure forming. And uh, pressure forming is, is basically um, a, a step up from your standard thermoforming or vacuum forming. So it is still vacuum. Uh, but what we're also going to do um, in the top is apply some air pressure to get some uh, much needed definition as well as depth of draw. Um, so the process is uh, pretty simple. Um, the uh, sheet is softened, vacuum's drawn through the tool, air pressure is applied on the opposite side of the sheet. Additional pressure forces the sheet into the mold. Um, process generally vacuum forming you could do in your basement. Uh, this particular company, uh, that is literally what they started doing in a gas oven was heating sheets of plastic, making interior replacement parts for Cessna aircraft, uh, window shades, uh, anything sort of all, all in, a, uh, in, a, in an airliner. Um, and the function was, re the reason why is low volume, um, relatively, at least at that time, uh, low definition. Um, what we are attempting to do um, and what we are promoting and, and what most people are not familiar with is sort of the, the next level of that, uh, which is a part that looks more like, more like these. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, the diagram here gives you a little bit of a, an idea. Again, the, the sheet is, uh, is heated in an oven. In many cases, it can be straight into an oven, straight out. Otherwise, you might see rotary machines or things like that, depending on the size. Uh, these particular machines are relatively, as it, when it relates to injection molding, low cost as a function of the pressures that are required. Um, so you, again, uh, you can see here, draw vacuum through the tool, apply air pressure from the top, which allows us to basically push the material down to get more definition in the part and deeper draw. Uh, over here is when we might add um, a plug into the equation. And again, this top platen is going to come down seal in uh, on the tool in what we call a moat. Um, the uh, top platen basically locks in place as we blow air pressure uh, through either the plug or through the, uh, uh, the pressure box. At the same time, we're drawing vacuum through. Now, the pressure that we're talking about here is upwards of 100 pounds of pressure. So it's not like injection by that means. So what the, the nice thing about that is, and what we'll get to a little bit later, is this relates to the tooling cost. Um, and this is ultimately sort of what the value proposition uh, ends up being. Um, the materials, we've got a wide selection of materials. What we do in this is a little bit of a distinction. We are a heavy gauge thermoformer. So uh, thin gauge thermoforming you're probably familiar with in line. Um, that would be blister packs, packaging, things like that. Uh, very high volume. You're going to mold the parts, die cut them in line, basically into a box. A very automated process. Um, those materials are, are much thinner. A heavy gauge thermoformer is technically um, about 30 thousandths of an inch up to we can mold a, a piece of material starting gauge of a half an inch. Uh, many of these materials, at least for this discussion here, uh, UL94VO rated. We can also do shielding and things like that. Um, most of our stuff need, needs to have this, this, uh, this flame rating. And then very high finishes. Uh, so ultimately, why are you here? Why does anybody even care about this? Um, these are the things that we actually make. So when you see units like this in offices or guys like you actually produce units like this, uh, what we are really presenting is, is nothing much more than a math exercise. Um, in parts like this, enclosures like this, the volumes are by definition low. 
Now that is all very relative to certain people. Some places come up say, I, I have very low volume. I only need a couple thousand parts at a time. Um, in our world, that's relatively high volume. So we, the world in which we operate is sort of dozens to thousands, very part specific. But our wheelhouse is in units like this and this, where it is a full assembly, maybe upwards of 15, 20, 25, 30 part numbers. Uh, the tooling cost for getting something like that up and off the ground ends up being pretty substantial, as you might imagine. And if you are only going to ship 15 of these things a month, the math just simply doesn't work. Um, so our tooling prices uh, are significantly lower, especially when we are talking about relatively larger parts. Um, and uh, those generally be in, in enclosures and things like that. Um, and so as you begin to do that trade-off, uh, that's ultimately where we come in. We are very much true niche manufacturing. I, I tell people all the time I can knock on you know, 100 doors, 98 people don't want to have anything to do with me, but the two out of 100, this is the absolute perfect thing. So it's not for every application, there's no doubt about that. Um, but when you are making a device, uh, generally by definition going into a laboratory or something like that, the volumes are just not going to be, it's not a consumer product. Um, and as such, you want it to look like a consumer product, function like that, um, but without all that tooling outlay and minimum volumes. Um, so we get into the, uh, the, the tooling construction and cost. There's a number of options for tooling. Um, in low volume uh, and or low definition parts or prototype type parts, we can use something as simple as wood. Uh, we'll use a foam board, uh, which is a, a REN board, a, whole, a hard foam. Um, but our production tooling is uh, aluminum. Um, much easier to machine, obviously much faster to machine. We can do cast tools for large tools, uh, uh, fully uh, temperature controlled depending on volumes. We can do action in tools, undercuts, things like that uh, to produce a part that, again, generally people do not associate with thermoforming. When they think of thermoforming, they think of very generic, not particularly aesthetically pleasing, uh, tolerances of a very wide uh, variety. That's actually the complete opposite of what, of what we actually do. Um, and obviously in the tooling, being the, the machining time, our, our lead time on a, uh, on a project, something like this, build the entire unit, uh, first pieces might be eight to 12 weeks. And you're talking about, you know, one, two, three, four, five, we got about eight tools in that, in that particular thing, so. Um, so the, the, the forming is actually, it's kind of an odd thing when I have this conversation with people is, is that we are a thermoformer. And at 30,000 feet, you can thermoform what we do or you can make pallets or bed liners. Um, the way I sort of classify uh, bed liners and pallets would be more of an industrial thermoformer. We are, coined the term if you will, a high spec thermoformer. So the actual process of molding is relatively the, the simplest thing that we that we actually do. Um, if it, now that is said, of course, if the tool is not right and you are not um, uh, sort of uh, clever with how you make the tool and construct the tool, the part is of course never going to be right. But that said, the molding is actually the easiest thing that we do. Uh, the real value that we are ultimately adding is after the molding is all of the machining and secondary features in order to have the part be repeatable, correct, look how it's supposed to look, things like that. So um, uh, most uh, of these high-end guys, much like us, again, you do the molding and then we are we're machining all of the secondary features via three, five, six axis, how, however you have, um, in order to get repeatable features. Tolerances of sort of plus or minus about five or 10 thousandths of an inch across features on a piece of plastic that is naturally kind of springy. Um, uh, another thing we'll touch on a little bit later, when we say secondary features, it is truly secondary. So sort of another benefit of the process is that as the enclosures come out, roll out to market, um, these features that are on the back side change and oftentimes we, we, we make products for customers that every time they place an order, they're shifting something around or adding a feature or making an additional cut. In our process, because it is secondary, we simply do a, a, a programming change. Uh, move a feature 5,000 this way, delete it all together, or add something. 
Uh, obviously, an injection though, that can be that can be accomplished, but you've, you're talking about large uh, lead times and cost to get that tool uh, changed. Uh, so again, our, our, our secondary features are basically glued in PVC on the back side, uh, machined all relative to each other, um, inserts, um, heat sunk in, and I've got a number of examples of that we can we can surely look at. Uh, again, to the point of the of the secondary features, um, being able to make those revisions quickly and cost effectively. Inherently, the kind of product that we are ultimately serving, um, by the time we're making the unit, you guys probably know more than anybody, it's already damn near obsolete or we're already working on the next version that needs to come out or maybe not even the next version, the next add-on to it, um, some sort of scanner or some additional feature inside. We actually have the ability, as long as you do not completely blow it up, um, we can usually handle features like that. Very low cost. The majority of our parts, this one here, um, is painted as a function of volumes. Uh, we actually sort of pride ourselves on doing very high-end finishes, class A finishes, uh, pearlescent paints, um, things like that, textures. We also do custom color materials as a function of, it's really a function of volume. We can do etching in tools so as to get mold tech features and things right out of the, right out of the tool. Uh, but we do a, a lot of painting, silk screening, uh, things like that. Again, tight machine tolerances, class A finishes, and in uh, and the inserts. Um, a lot of the parts and, and things that we end up looking at is uh, conversions over from something. So maybe first, second generation, we're going to just stick it in a metal box, get it tested, do whatever we need to do, get it out to market. Um, what we find, and we oftentimes are in the middle of, is uh, engineering and marketing sort of doing this. Um, what we are trying to sort of bring to light is, is that we, we don't have to make sacrifices for either of those. The, the, the part can be fully functional and it can still look good. And, um, and whether anyone likes to admit it or not, if the part looks nicer and has fancy LED lights, we sell more of them. So it just is what it is. Um, but a lot, of our, a lot of our customers, again, will be in a sheet metal box. They, they are concerned that we've been making it in this box. I don't know how to do anything differently. My volumes don't warrant anything else. And they're just simply unaware that our process and these kind of parts even exist. Um, so as many customers, we have a large number of big name customers. Um, and every time we bring them through the plant or show them these pieces, they've been vendors or customers of ours for years and years and years and just simply don't know the capabilities in, in, in the process. So they think of, again, they think of thermoforming as, as one thing. I mean, in actuality, really within the six, last six or eight years, the complexity and the type of parts that you are able to put out um, have gone up really dramatically. Um, and so. Uh, our, our, our biggest challenge really is getting the word out and educating people like you that this kind of process exists and again in the right application um, it can be a uh, can be a real lifesaver so I don't really have much more than that again I, I had we can I didn't want to get into too much details in the molding aspect of it or anything like that um, but I guess generally speaking if if if, if you have low volume products um, and I would classify that as Again, anywhere from maybe dozens to a couple hundred units a year, uh, maybe a thousand units a year assemblies, um, we can be a real viable option for you. Um, the part will look and feel like what you, want to, what, what you want it to look like without having to do all the capital outlay that becomes uh, rather cumbersome. So, does anybody have any questions? Make all perfect sense? Good? All right. I'm right around the corner. If anybody has any other questions, by all means, let me know. Thanks very much.